What up, everyone? This is um, the fourth Aggie, and uh, I'm trying out a new method of doing uh, time lapses, where you're not just listening to music and nothing else. So uh, I'm going to be talking over this 30 minute video, uh, which is basically four and a half hours of uh, raw footage turned into a time lapse, just so you know what's going on. So essentially this model, um, I'm trying to actually sculpt it and to sculpt it, you know, maybe add some details, little scratches, bumps and bruises here and there. The problem is in, uh, in mud box where I'm trying to sculpt, I'm having problems where it's like, uh, you've got some faces that are more than four sided or whatever. So the geometry has actually got some problems. So in, what I have to do now is I have to go through the geometry and create quads and proper edge loop to, topology. So, little you know, a lot, lot of extra work I have to do to get this model prepped and ready to go, but I think it'll be worth it in the end. Uh, at the end of this model, you'll see that the actual edge topology is pretty, pretty well done. Um, but I'll explain things as I go along here as well. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm taking an edge loop and extending it all the way across, up and down. Uh, and it's gonna add extra topology, the geometry really, uh, which will add poly counts and other stuff. But uh, at the end of the day, what I'm hoping to do is create a normal map. Now, when you look at the, the UVs for something like this, um, it's really the UV shell that defines uh, the texture. A normal map is a, is a texture on a UV map. Uh, or defined by the UV map. So really adding this much geometry is only necessary for creating that map or make, making this, this model able to be put into a, a program that I can generate a map out of. So this is a lot of prep work. Um, this is why it's called Sculpt Prep. And uh, <laughs> you'll see that this video is only gonna cover this one arm up to the top. I guess basically the, this half of the, the model because really that's how long it took to get this topology perfect. Well, where it needs to be. There are, you know, a few triangles here and there, but in general, um, it's, you know, the edge loops work for the most part, and there's no dwindling edge loops that terminate, uh, except at the borders. So, I really gotta, gotta go back and do this again with the other model, the other side of the model, and then I do it for the rest of the models in this, um, this thing including the guns, the tail, the back area, the head, you know. It's going to be a lot of extra work, and I'm, I'm going to guesstimate around 20 actual hours of work. Now, what you'll notice is I haven't, in this video, I don't actually take a break. Um, I'm working at four and a half hours. It's just that intensive. Um, seeing here is I was having problems because uh, with my every operation he makes a, uh, is, is, is history. <laughs> so, over time, when you build up a giant list of history nodes in your, your model, it begins to bog, bog down and do funny stuff. So when I notice it's slowing down, is when I go out there and I'll go to the, uh, the object mode, and I'll hit uh, Alt-Shift-D for deleting history. And I already accidentally wiped my rigging information from, from this, so it's not that big of a deal, because I already have to go re-rig re the damn neck again. Um, but when you delete the history, you can start fresh again, basically. And I'll do that for a while, and then I get bogged down again. And then I'll just have to, you know, wipe and wipe and uh, rinse or rinse and go along. I forgot the euphemism there. <coughs> so what you're seeing here basically is the um, that rubber rubber bit that I'm designating the rubber bit uh, for the joint. Uh, it, it doesn't have all the edge loops going across, even though it's connected to the model technically. And um, so what I'm doing is I'm just continuing those edge loops across, just to make that one uniform edge loop. Or really, to make it an, an edge loop, you know, <laughs> to combine edge loops together, more or less.
I was talking to people about this model, and um, well, I mean, we were really, really surprised he was able to actually model it the way he did because he's not the Durka art, the one who made this model. Um, he didn't, he's not really the most experienced modeler, but the fact that he is able to make it this, you know, is pretty good. I think what he did actually was he tried to save polygons. This is going to source, it's not going to be. You know, it's specific, specific, yeah, specifically being made for source, so I have to reduce poly counts. And doing it like this is going to create so many extra polys. So I can see why he decimated it. And I'm, I'm not sure if he did or not, because I haven't really asked him. But when you look at it, it's like, oh, well, there was an edge loop here. He, it's just missing, missing parts. Like it, it had a, ver it's had you know multiple verts on one of the loops, um, horizontal loops that had vertices, the stagnant vertices, where I was having to put um, edge loops coming down, continuing those loops. So I knew there were edge loops there when he created it. It was just whenever he sent it off, he already decimated it, which is okay if I wasn't planning on doing high, uh, high detail normal mapping on this. So another thing to consider is um, on the rigging part is because I went out there and um, well, uh, I was going to sculpt it. Sculpting the geometry usually changes uh, things anyway. Uh, I wasn't planning on doing high, you know, high, uh, highly intensive uh, sculpting, but even still, it'll change the vertices, even at a high detail sculpt. You know, I leave the base base sculpt alone, I'll go a couple of levels up, that kind of thing. That that's where I'm going to fail. Uh, well, I'd have to go out there and redo the rigging anyway. So whatever happens, happens, and we'll see where we go. So I'm going to now just talk whenever uh, something comes up. So. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm using what's called the, the multi-cut tool. As you can see, I'm in the modeling toolkit right now. And the modeling, um, sorry, the multi-cut tool lets you snap with uh, shift. And uh, you can set the increments in that control panel on the right there, if you go down. Uh, but I have it set to snap to every 10. So what I'm doing is I'm estimating here, you know, sometimes I need to define a middle ground you know, where I, I sometimes I can go straight through the middle between two edges and make an edge loop. Sometimes I have to extend two edge loops within two other edge loops, so I have to do some math. <laughs> math was never my strong suit. Uh, oh, and here I was just making the edge loop more continuous because uh, it was looking kind of funky. I mean, I, you don't have to, but uh, reducing the amount of uh, tries and stuff is good for sculpting and stuff, so thought, you know, hey, we might as well since we're here. But yeah, no, you hit shift when you're using the multi-cut tool on a, a line, uh, edge, and uh, it'll give you like a red line and like a dot in the middle. You'll click, and if you just leave it the way it is, it'll be 50%, um, but you can uh, click and drag to hit one of the other percentages. And actually, it will tell you next to your, your cursor um, what percentage uh, it will be. Now, what I've noticed also is I'll be trying to uh, split in thirds, and I'll go 66% here, and the next face up, the place I need to be is actually 33%. So you have to be flexible, because, you know, it's going to change sometimes. So keep keep that in mind when you're doing it. Now, you see, I've, I have a... I'm <laughs> working the, ho the hoof now, the bottom of the hoof. I'm trying to reduce all these, these uh, tries, but... What you're going to see is we're going to have a couple, you know, a small handful of, uh, you know, three, three-edged uh, faces here, and uh, we're going to get, we're not going to have any ingons, which are more than four uh, sides to a face, uh, but we'll definitely have some tries. Now, the, the good thing is, this is the bottom of the hoof, and realistically, nothing's going to be rigged there, and the sculpting there, I, I don't know if I'll do anything. If I do, uh, it, it probably won't really matter. 
uh, but it's hidden away. So in a general use case, it's okay to have a couple tries, um, but you know, try to reduce them where you can. Like I just started creating a new edge loop here to uh, continue the, you know, the quads, but I eventually figured out later on that uh, there's nothing I can do to prevent that. Um, so <laughs> I got the geometry kind of where I, a good enough estimation so that everything kind of looped together. That was the basically the, the first priority. Reducing as many tries is really the secondary one. Here I'm just continuing on each and every one of those loops creates a lot of unnecessary geometry uh, for most applications, you know, or most, you know, use cases. But of course, we're not working most use cases, we're working on sculpting, so uh, we've got to get past that issue Mudbox has. And I'm pretty sure ZBrush has too, and every other sculpting platform. More eight speed, I think, really. Yeah, four and a half hours on the maximum there. 30 minutes on the video here. Uh, that's 400 or four times two, eight, or around eight to nine uh, times speed. So you can just imagine how tedious this work is. Uh, I'm not going to blame the original artist simply because um, I know how that goes. I'm not the best modeler when I make stuff too sometimes. And whenever I'm trying to like make when I'm not trying to make a model for sculpting, I really won't care all that much about topology. Simply because who cares? <laughs> if it if the 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 topology looks great and it's just a static prop that's never been sculpted or nothing, you know, what's the point? Why well, have all the extra geometry? It's just unnecessary stuff. So we will see in a lot of some of my models is it's just absolutely gross. I mean there's still quads usually. Uh, but sometimes I've got ingons and I've got uh, non-connecting uh, excuse me edges, so I'm not free of those mistakes, and really I don't really consider them mistakes as much as unintended consequences, really. Because I don't think he had the idea that anyone's going to sculpt it, so <laughs> it, dropping it down makes a lot of sense, especially when you're trying to sell the model as viable, because tens of thousands of polygons that are necessary are. You know, all that extra memory you don't want to waste during uh, animation. So, and these are going to be meant for animation. You'll find here I'm trying to solve a puzzle. It's much. It's very much a puzzle game. Uh, modeling is, and that's why I kind of like it because a lot of people are like, "Well, they're all about the latest first-person shooter and whatever." Well, that's cool, but at the end of the day, I have something to show for it here. <laughs> and I, I, okay, don't take offense. I'm not trying to poke fun at gamers. I'm just considering it a game to myself because it's more or less a puzzle game uh, of trying to get everything working. And you'll see that I spend the majority of my time at home uh, modeling, uh, aside from the standard like watching TV shows and stuff. But I don't own a TV. Well, I don't own a TV service, so this is my entertainment. <laughs> now with uh, Fallout 4 coming out soon, and if you're watching this after Fallout 4 comes out, uh, I'll have a new game to get excited about. But for now, I'm making a Fallout-inspired K2 
character who is, if you don't know and you're watching this, wondering what the hell is this. Step one, it is Fallout Equestria, which is, of course, the uh, p pony version of uh, Fallout and uh, whatever, you know. People hate it, people like it, whatever. As you can see, the model over there is what we're working on. It's a uh, basically your power suit armor on top of a pony. His character, the character name is actually Steel Hooves, as you can see in the the title there. He's an interesting character. When we working on the radio play, we've got a really good voice actor for him. He's got a very deep voice, but he's also a very talented uh, voice actor. So he makes for a very interesting character overall. But yeah. <laughs> I, I actually wasn't going to do much with this, um, but I got so much pressure for... Well, not pressure, but like, everyone was really excited for it. So, I make models simply because I want people to enjoy them. <clears throat> the more use people have out of it, which means the more people who use it, the more likely I am to actually work on it. So, um, the, given the reaction that I received... It's like, I'll go ahead and do it. And I'm sorry for the the other time lapses that have no voice to them because, you know, sometimes people like to watch these, these and just have, like, music going. Sometimes they don't. Um, but I'm trying to go out there, and the reason I put up time, time lapses is one, to show progress. Uh, two, show that I'm doing stuff, which is part of progress, but showing that I'm not inactive. And uh, three, really, is to teach you how to do this yourself. And there's no better teacher than really doing it yourself, but the best I can come is showing you how it's done. So, uh, a lot, not a lot of people, not a lot of people use Maya, and uh, a lot of people use Blender, and there's plenty of resources out there. But when it comes to people uh, in the gaming community that actually use Maya, it's really limited. At least the the non-professional ones, at least. <laughs> but uh, the non-professional ones, yeah, they do use a lot of Blender. And Blender's fine, you know, I mean, people come to me and are like, they think that I'm biased against Blender because Blender's free and, you know, it's it's a biased pro you know, it's it's a uh, competing package. It really, it's a tool, and so is Maya. And Maya's a tool of my choice. And since, uh, since I started, really, I've discovered at least eight or nine people in my local community. Not local as in, in person, but in, in this culture. That, uh, that that use my or want to use my so it's gotten a lot better um, but certainly if you're using blender you could take you may not be able to use the tools that I use but you can take a lot of the concepts that I use um, and apply them onto your own modeling I think that's, that's the thing that a lot of people mistake for especially when I go to conventions and do panels and stuff and get questions is well one is one package better than the other or how do I do this in this one particular program? And it really comes down to is they need to understand the modeling, the foundations, the, the higher bits of modeling that are not program specific, like quads, edge loops, uh, everything else that I'm doing right now can be directly translated to, to, uh, to Blender. As long as you know how to use the tool for that. You know, if you know how to use edge loop splits and uh, splicing, whatever they, whatever they call it, and as I'm told, <laughs> Blender has a better modeling toolkit, but better is relative to the person talking. So um, I've gotten so used to this modeling toolkit, and they, Autodesk really has done really well with uh, 2016. I've had problems with 2014. They, they introduced this new, I guess, modeling toolkit and a bunch of the big changes since 2014 version. And I've always had problems with uh, stability issues. And so far, knock on wood, I've had a better experience with this per this version than any other. And uh, I consider my myself lucky for being able to actually use this software because I want to say I've been using it since 2009, since I, b I bought the original copy for students who get it for free, which if I would have waited a year. I wouldn't have spent five hundred dollars on Maya, twenty two thousand nine, which I still have the um, the, uh, the the physical hard casing, which I I, I consider like a trophy almost, uh, simply because it's like my first big software purchase I ever made in my life, and it, even then it was still 
400 $500. <laughs> it was ridiculous at the time. I had just graduated from college and uh, I was like, I'm going to make use of my educational discount. At the time, I didn't have a job in education, so I couldn't make use of it. And of course, I try not to encourage um, try not to encourage software piracy when, when you can avoid it. Especially when you're talking about 3D applications. Um, you can get... Well, for example, for, for what I'm using for painting, Mari. It was used, and it's most well known for, its painting for the movie Avatar. The, uh, you know, where they went to the alien planet and it was all colorful and stuff. That's what it's really no noted for, and that's an early build. And I never really got to use it, and I never really pirated it because I can paint Mudbox in Mudbox. Uh, but as I read, there's so many bigger features in it that I was like, I wanted to try it, but I don't want to pay money for it, really, or pay big money for it. And then it comes on to Steam as Mari Indie. And the limitations, of course, are a few things, but not enough that would discourage me from, from paying, you know, twelve dollars a month for it. And I could go out there and buy it flat out. What I'm basically doing is I'm trying it out. I think uh, Maya LT it's basically a stripped version of Maya. It's stripped of the rendering bits. And you can do all the modeling stuff here in Maya LT. Pretty much in the same way. It's the same program, it's just stripped out a few features. And it's pretty relatively cheap. It's not as cheap as Mari, unfortunately, but you can either do that or really what I really suggest is just go learn Blender because you'll be able to do all this stuff in Blender. I don't know why I'm talking about that. I'm, we moved to a new section. So this, this bit right here, <laughs> I'm still going up and continuing the edge loops, but I got to an area where I was really confined and it's the use of my, um, my 3D connection space explorer, which is a, a hardware device makes it a lot easier to move around the, the viewport as you see. These are all, this is an external mouse that moving my camera. It's not me hitting a, the typical alt and using a mouse. But even then, getting into some of these places is damn near impossible. So what I have to use is uh, a technique call, uh, where I select certain faces and hide the rest. And then hopefully I'll have the faces I need to work on. And whenever you're working in such, such tight places and your edge loops aren't working together, like right here, I'm missing a face. <laughs> you miss you miss certain bits sometimes in your work around it. But uh, one thing you could do if you're doing this a lot with the same faces is uh, is create a uh, selection a quick selection set. With a quick selection set set, sorry, <laughs> you can uh, define the faces in a selection set and then select use that selection set to re-highlight those faces which really comes in handy whenever you're working on certain bits that are usually the same things you're working on in, in mass together. So I've done that before on characters. I'm not doing it here now just because I didn't do the prep work for it. I didn't see need for it either, but now that I look at it, maybe I should put something in there.
right, now I'm just going in and checking these things, and I see the topology is messed up again, so I go in there, and I'm, I'm okay with, you know, that triangle there. It's fine. That was an end gun, so I corrected that. And now we're going back to continuing the edge loops. Now, if you notice, the manifolds, really, the it's the same object, it's just some parts are not connected together. That is like that the legs themselves are not physically attached to the interior of the armor, even though they're part of the same mesh. So that's when I say a manifold. I mean, it may be wrong, but you know what I mean. <coughs> so, working on this, you have to be careful with in your own in your own following of the topology. Sometimes it won't connect. Sometimes it will. You'll see in there, like, it'll terminate, you know, by the neck. Sometimes it'll terminate down there towards the top of the metal armor. Simply because some of those bits are not connected to the main mesh completely. Really, the, the amount of geometry that's here, not really necessary for animation, simply because it's not going to be a soft body. So I'm hoping what I'm going to do is uh, test a normal map on this. I'll take the normal, make a normal map, map based on this and then test it on the lower ge uh, poly geometry. Because I don't need all the geometry for anim for rigging those joints, simply because it's not a, so a soft body, not completely. The neck area is going to be movable, you know, the joints here, the black parts, really are where I'm defining the, uh, the, the, the bendable bits. And those are where <laughs> I have to do some clever you know, rigging stuff. That'll be a challenge in and of itself. Here I'm using edge loop cuts to uh, cr go ahead and create those remaining edge loops because uh, I know the top of the model is up there. What that does, it just makes it a lot faster. So whenever you're modeling, keep in mind where you're at and what you can use. And sometimes you can make it a little bit faster. Yeah, so I pre-allocate pre those edge loops and then connect them together. It's really nice that you can do that with all the multi-tool, multi-cut tool. So I've isolated off the that half and I'm testing the edge loops to see if they'll highlight up and down. Now, you notice right there on the armor, kind of towards the, <laughs> I'm trying to talk to the video that's moving, it creates kind of like a point on the top of the leg, like a, a point ledge, whatever, kind of like a, a guard against a knife, I don't know. That stops the edge loop from going. That doesn't mean it's a, you know, end god. It just means the, the actual point is confusing <laughs> for, for Maya, so. That's where I go out there and I'll go above that and then test that loop and see if it follows. So usually it will. Here I noticed that I actually missed a few loops on the inside. Well, they're all in the same same faces. Uh, I'm just on the inside of those faces because it's easier to see the stuff. I'm using a technique where I go, I'm using a technique where I go back and forth between points. I'm creating these in, intermediary intermediary uh, edge loops, and then I go back and delete them. That's a bit faster to do. Thank you for joining me on this time lapse. Thanks for listening to me for 30 minutes, and I look forward to bringing more time lapses to you, hopefully with narration. Let me know if you like me talking over music over my own videos, and let me know what you think of the time lapses in general. It really helps me to know, you know, what people think. So thanks.